Ready to start? Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk today. Just want to say thank you to the Circle CityCon organizers. This is a great conference, isn't it? And I'm, I'm having such a great time. Um, let me ask you a question. Have you ever read a risk assessment or a vendor security report on the latest security threat and you just felt like something was a little bit off, that the numbers didn't add up, your spidey sense was tingling? But why question it, right? The authors are experts, of course, right? They wouldn't be trying to manipulate us, would they? Or would they? So before I get a little bit too deep, uh, let me introduce myself. So my name is Tony Martin Vagy. I've been in the IT and InfoSec field for about 20 years now. Um, I currently work at Lending Club. We're a San Francisco-based FinTech firm. And I'm the company's enterprise security strategist. So what that basically means is I try to solve really hard information security problems with a little bit of math, a little bit of economics, a little bit of decision science. Of course, you sprinkle in some luck in there once in a while and um, hopefully get the job done. Um, feel free to reach out to me over Twitter. There's my Twitter handle. And of course, the usual disclaimers apply. The opinions I'm about to say uh, belong to me alone and not to my employer. So how to lie with statistics. This was a book written in 1954 by Daryl Huff. Daryl Huff was the editor of Better Homes and Gardens in the 1940s and 50s. And he had a lifelong passion for statistics, even though he wasn't a statistician. He was more of a gardener than he was a mathematician. But ironically, this book is the best-selling statistics book of all time, even today. So throughout the book, he introduced the general public to very common ways that statistics and graphics and words are used to manipulate facts. So um, an example from his book, um, I would imagine that everyone here remembers the TV show Mad Men on AMC. So it was the admin on Madison Avenue that really drew Huff's ire. He really went after them in his book here. Some of the claims they made, like, nine out of 10 doctors prefer Newport cigarettes, stuff like that. Um, he saw those as plain tricks with numbers and fact bending. So he exposed a lot of that in his 1954 book here. So what I've done here is I've taken the foundation that his book set about 60 years ago. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, 60 years ago, and I'm trying to look at it from an information security perspective. And I think at the end of this presentation, you'll agree with me that a lot of the foundational work that Huff did 60 years ago is just as relevant today as it was back then. So we're going to go over some classic ways that numbers and statistics are used to bend the truth. So first up to bat is surveys. Did you know that 9 out of 10 households agree that surveys are bad? But what households, of course, right? Surveys are very common in the information security space. And after all, who doesn't love infographics? They're a very effective way to convey complex information in very few words. Infographics also happen to be the easiest and the most common way to steer readers toward a particular conclusion. So what's a survey? A survey is basically a poll. We're all familiar with polls. Gallup polls um, happen every electric, uh, election cycle. So you're basically asking a small group of people a particular question. And then you take the answers and extrapolate the answers to apply to the general population. So for example, I read recently, I think it was a few weeks ago, that 59% of CISOs say that they experienced cyber attacks in the last year in which the attacks were successful. So the attackers over, overcame the company's defenses. So in that survey, the, the people that did the survey, they didn't go out and talk to all CISOs in the world. That would be impossible. They pulled a portion, a small portion, and that's called a sample. And then from that small portion, they extrapolated a generality 
to apply to all CISOs. Surveys are very common in vendor-sponsored security reports. In fact, I would say that most vendor-sponsored security reports are built on survey research. So as security professionals, we take these reports, we read them, we learn from them, we quote them in steering committee meetings. When a senior executive comes up to us and asks us to quantify the risk about some threat on the horizon, the easiest way to do that is to go find a survey. And the reason for that is, is they're so numerous. There's, there's so much research out there right now that's based on surveys. So let's take a deeper look at what a survey is and some of the problems with them. So surveys like Gallup polls or vendor security reports, they seem simple on the surface. You just go out and ask a whole bunch of people. Um, but they're, they're actually really hard to do correctly. And there actually is a science behind surveys, and it's rooted in math and statistics. In order for your survey results to mean anything, your, 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 your survey needs to be statistically sound. And there's three components of a statistically sound survey. So the first one is defining the population. What is the, the large group that I'm studying? And the next one is sample size, so we can't talk to that entire population. It's the size of the group that we're, we're actually going to ask questions to. Um, good survey takers will ensure that that small sample size is as representative of the general population as they possibly can make it. And the next and last thing is, uh, it's a term from statistics from math, and it's called a confidence interval. And you might be familiar with this in presidential polls and political polls, it's usually communicated as a margin of error, plus or minus. The larger the, sam the sample size, the smaller the margin of error is. So those are the components of a statistically sound survey. What happens when a survey isn't statistically sound? So we get bias. So when you're referring to surveys, one could say that a survey is biased when the statistic that they're quoting, the statistic in the report, is systematically different from the general population that's being studied. And there are many forms of bias that are, that are found in statistics and by extension surveys, but the most common one is selection bias. So selection bias occurs when some individuals that you've selected for your survey are more or less likely to participate in the survey than others, and that biases the survey. So let me give you an example of how this would happen. Let's say, let's say you, you work for a security vendor, and you want to do research on um, the impact of DDoS attacks at, at, a typical, at a typical company. So you decide to do survey-based research. You go out and you buy an email list. You buy a million email addresses from a multitude of companies that offer this. And you do two things. So you send out your survey to those million people and you tell them, A, you have to be an information security professional in order to participate in the survey. That's going to be an honor system, of course, because you're not going to go check the LinkedIn profiles of all one million people. And the second thing you tell them, and this is try to try to get people to respond, the second thing you tell them is, if you fill this out, I will enter you in a drawing to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So how many of you have received this email? Most people here, I think I got one last week actually. So the survey comes back, you compile the results, and you find out that, sorry about that. So you find out that 89% of security professionals think that DDoS is the biggest threat to their company. That's actually not true. It's 89% of people that actually clicked on your spammy email and responded to your survey, whether or not they're information security professionals or not. And another thing you have to ask yourself is, 
If you're offering someone a $50 Amazon gift card to fill out an information security survey, are you really getting good, unbiased people participating? Um, just the fact that you're offering a gift can skew the results. And if you don't believe me, uh, go on Reddit and check out the subreddit Beer Money. And the scams that people have going for surveys is, is amazing. People will do literally anything for a $5 Starbucks gift card, including commit all sorts of survey fraud. So keep that in mind next time you open up a vendor security report and it's based on survey results. And one thing you probably could do, I've done this, is take a, a vendor security report and um, um, take, a, take a look at the survey methodology and go on Twitter and go back in the past, go a year back and find out if they offered any type of bribery for, the, for participation and more often than not, they do. Um, so I wanna show you a real world example of this. Um, so we've, we've gone over a, a couple key points in what makes a statistic, uh, what makes a survey statistically sound. Um, who has seen Ponemon research? So this is the cost of a data breach report. This is the latest copy, 2017. This has to be the single most quoted vendor security report in our industry. I see it everywhere. I see it quoted in conferences. I see it in risk analysis. I see it in um, risk, uh, quoted in boardrooms. I, I see it everywhere. And I'm gonna flip to the back of the page here. And Ponemon discloses limitations of the survey. They disclose their own biases. And there's a, a pretty big, pretty big disclosure page. And I'm gonna read this to you. I'm just gonna read one sentence out of the, the whole page here. Statistical inferences, margins of error, and confidence intervals. Um, I lost my space here. Okay, statistical inferences, margins of error, and confidence intervals cannot be applied to these data because our sampling methods are not scientific. So I'm gonna let that sink in for a moment. I know, what? So what, do I, what am I supposed to use this for? Okay, so let's go on to the next topic of how people can lie with statistics, and that's graphs. So this is one of the most common ways that people can mislead with statistics. It's mostly unintentional in this category, but sometimes it's on purpose. And this method is through data visualization. And this is essentially taking numbers that might not mean much to the human eye. Um, it's basically a, a list of numbers or a set of numbers and then you represent the data visually in order to help tell a story. So there are many types of data visualization. There's uh, bar charts, there's pie charts, line, area, radar, scatter plots, the list goes on and on and on. I'm gonna focus on the, the few most common forms of data visualization in, in business. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take a look at pie charts. Um, this is just a, a data table here. Uh, pie charts are probably the most common form of data visualization. If you were to ask data vis experts, it's probably the most hated to. The reason why they're hated is because it's very hard to convey information properly because pie charts just inherently distort reality. And I'll show you that. So here's a data set. This is security incidents in 2017 displayed in data form only. It's, it's very straightforward. So we have five data points here, some numbers. Let's fire up Excel and throw this in a 2D pie chart. So it's very straightforward. This is the same data that we just had in the table. One thing to note is this chart makes the assumption that we know about all security incidents that happened last year, and this is a graphic representation of these types of incidents. All data viz makes some form of assumption. So how can we manipulate this to tell a different story without changing any of the underlying data? 
So I did a few subtle, sneaky things to change the story here. Now, I didn't change the underlying data in Excel, but I decided, let's just say I want to underemphasize hacking incidents. I'm meeting with executives, and I really want the executives to focus in on lost or stolen laptops and mobile devices. I don't want them to ask me about hacking. So I did a few things. I converted this 2D pie chart to a 3D pie chart. And this is the best way to manipulate data because 3D pie charts make the green and red slices there. They take up more surface area. They, they're bigger to the eye. And I moved the purple slice to the back. It's, it's smaller. And the next thing I did is I modified the x-axis. And what this basically did is I spun the pie. So if you notice the, the other pie chart, if you remember the other pie chart, the purple slice was in front, I spun the pie so that the purple slice was in the back. Not only does this make the purple slice look smaller than it should be proportionally, it actually is smaller than it should be. It takes up less surface area on this, on this screen right here. You can take out a tape measure and measure it. And the last thing I did, and this is really sneaky, is I removed the data labels. The previous chart had numbers on each slice here. I removed the numbers. Basically what I did to you, the audience, is I removed your frame of reference. I removed the scale that you have, that your brain has, to visually make comparisons. It's really hard now. Now you have to solely trust your eyes to figure out which slice is larger than the other one. So let's take this a little bit further. Let's say I really don't want you to ask me about hacking. Let's say I'd rather have a root canal. So if a little manipulation is good, then a lot must be better. So I moved the y-axis. The y-axis is this. So I shifted the pie so you're basically looking at it head on. Like you're basically viewing the side of the pie. The purple slice is way in the back, it's tiny. And again, I didn't change any of the underlying data here, it's exactly the same. The only thing I did is change the 3D rotation options in Excel. And you're probably saying this looks ridiculous, right? Who would do this? But who has seen this ridiculousness in a business setting? I have, yeah, there's several hands. I, I see this all the time. So one last pie here. Let's say I changed my mind. I want to talk about hacking now. I want to overemphasize hacking. Remember, hacking from the first pie is only 3% of incidents, but I made it much bigger by converting it to a 3D exploded pie. Now, what I did is I played with a 3D perspective to make the purple slice as big as possible. This one right here. And I, I, I did this. I took out a tape measure and I was measuring my monitor as I was clicking on the rotation in Excel, and this is as big as I could get it. So the purple slice takes up the most surface area right here um, than just a regular uh, pie slice should, and it also takes up more surface area than 3% should. I completely changed the story here without changing any of the underlying data. So this begs the question, should we be using pie charts at all? So there are some very strong opinions on the subject. Walter Hickey is a journalist, and among many things, he works for Nate Silver's 538. Um, Edward Tufte, he's a visualization pioneer and statistician. Both him and Walter Hickey think that no one should use pie charts. I'm personally not as much as a pie chart hater as these guys, but I do use them sparingly. Um, when I do use pie charts, I always try to keep five things in mind. So these are five tips for you. So the first one is pie charts always have to represent the whole of something, 100%. Pie charts are most appropriate when you're communicating a ratio. If you don't know what that whole number is, 
or if your data doesn't support being visualized in the form of percentages of a whole, like 100%, consider a bar chart or a line chart. So this chart here, this isn't a ratio. This is actually a data visualization of a multiple choice survey. The slices add up to way over 100%. And I know they're trying to be clever because it's a, it's a pizza survey um, visualized in the form of a pie chart. But in this, uh, in this example, I would have used a bar chart, which is best for, vi for visualizing multiple choice answers. So, uh, so tip number two, the data that you're representing should match the, the data visualization in terms of scale, representation, and the numbers that you use. So this is a form of a pie chart called the donut chart. And you'll notice that these numbers are different, 38%, 23%, 69%. But you'll also notice that the green slices are exactly the same. So um, that's, a, that's a big miss on, on GoDaddy's side. Uh, so here's another example of the data not matching the visualization. OK, so tip number three, math. Please, math, it's not hard. Your percentages have to add up to 100%. And there's also another thing here. This is a 3D pie. Do you notice that the 60% up front looks as big, if not bigger, than the 70% in back? It's bigger, right? It's not just me. Yeah. It's because they used a 3D pie. They rotated it this way. Distorted reality. OK, so tip number four. <laughs> Try to limit the number of data sets that you're, compare, that you're comparing to, to two or three, four maximum. The purpose of a pie chart is to allow the reader to very quickly make visual comparisons between data. Um, anything more than four, the reader has a very hard time visually making those comparisons. And as example, this is nearly impossible to decipher, let alone make any type of comparison between a lot of these slices. So fifth tip is exploded pie charts and 3D pie charts. So there is no professional reason ever to use a 3D pie chart. Pie charts are okay if you have to use it. Don't use 3D. They're the worst. They just are. If pie charts are the nickelback of data viz, 3D pie charts are milli vanilli. It's just fake. So this is from a Steve Jobs keynote in 2008. Um, look at this chart here. So 19.5%, which I don't think it's coincidental, is the apple slice. So the green is the apple slice. That's up front. That's visually bigger than the 21.2. Um, so remember. With these types of charts, anything up front is going to visually look bigger. Why, why is that? I don't think I've harped on 3D pie charts enough. So let me show you why. In this graphic here, which line is bigger? Um, which horizontal line is longer, the top one or the bottom one? Who thinks the top one? Okay, who thinks the bottom one? Who thinks it's an optical illusion? <laughs> OK, yeah, you guys got me on that one. Um, both of these are actually the same, but why does it look different to our eye? It's because of these. It creates a, a, a framing effect. It tricks our mind into perceiving the graphics differently. It's the same thing here. This 3D pie chart is an optical illusion. This is a real a real pie chart that I pulled off of a security report on data breach causes. I, I did this again with my monitor. I pulled out a tape measure and measured how much surface area the red 19% takes up and the orange 19% takes up. The red 19% is measurably bigger. It takes up more surface area. So this is an optical illusion. So let's look at line charts next. So I personally like line and bar charts when I'm trying to visualize pretty simple data. 
Um, but it's, it's actually possible to lie with line charts too. So ask yourself, how does the graphic on the right tell a different story than the graphic on the left? So they're both malware infections. And I'll give you a hint here. They're both the same data. I use the same data for both of them. And what I did here is I did something really sneaky. So you'll notice that this one, the scale starts at zero and ends to 600. So you have 600 points in your scale to visualize data. This one starts at 400. It makes malware infections look a lot more drastic. So if you were to hand the one on the right to an executive, that tells a totally different story. I mean, they might even say, oh my God, we're in the middle of a ransomware ep or a malware ap epidemic here. What do we do? Um, so a, a good tip here is to always look at the scale that's being used. A good line graph will usually start at zero. So if it's not, ask yourself, how does the changing the scale alter the reader's perception of the data visualization? So here's another one. Um, I only pick on Apple because I'm their biggest fan. Um, so this is a line graph variant called a filled line graph, and this is another way to manipulate data. So this is from a presentation that Tim Cook did um, illustrating the number of iPhones the firm has sold. So there's a few problems with this. The first one is, what am I looking at? So in the, in the previous line graph, I had the vertical scale that I manipulated. The vertical scale is not even here. So you can't even tell if where, the, where it starts at, or if, it's, or if it's being changed, or if it's being manipulated. It's just a steep blue mountain of Apple goodness. And I think that looks pretty good. They certainly have sold a lot of iPhones. Um, and the other problem I have is a use of the word cumulative. I think that it's a little bit misleading. So it leads the reader to believe, or it leads the reader to think that this graph's about how many iPhones are out there, out there in the wild, but this really isn't the case. iPhones break, they're thrown away, they're traded in. Um, I think that it's fine to talk about cumulative uh, sales, but you have to give the reader context. And context is what this graph is missing. So the next picture does this. So a blogger over at Quartz, QZ.com, he overlaid a bar chart on top of the cumulative line chart and added a vertical scale right here. So he essentially fixed the graph for Tim Cook by adding scale and context. Now we know what we're looking at. Okay, so bar graphs. And you're probably thinking, oh no, not bar graphs too, right? What's wrong with bar graphs? So bar graphs don't have the same inherent problems that pie charts have. This is why most of the time I prefer using this type of data visualization. But once again, it is possible to manipulate the truth with this. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll tell you that the data on both the left and the right is identical. But does anyone know what I did here? Yeah. It's that scale thing again. This one, the scale starts at zero. Over here, I changed it to start at 200. So it distorts the, the, the bars. They seem much more drastic visually than they really are. So how do we see this? Where have we seen this in real life? So here's a vertical bar chart from a blog called Tech Radar. And they're comparing the performance of AMD chips with Intel chips with a video game called Total War. So the graph would lead the believer that the Intel i9 chip is nearly three times as fast as the AMD Threadripper. But look closely. It's that scale problem again. They started at 67.4. If you measure the difference between the two chips' performance, there's less than a 2% difference between the two chips. So Tech Radar received a lot of criticism and derision over that chart that they put up on their blog. They've since fixed it, and now the scale starts at zero. So the difference between the two chips from a human eye perspective 
is nearly indistinguishable. I can't tell the difference between the two. So here's the old graph. Here's the new graph. Why did they do that? It's, it's mind-boggling. Sponsorship, probably. Okay, the semi-attached figure. This is one of my favorite ones because it is so pervasive everywhere. You see it everywhere, especially in vendor security reports. Um, I, I was at RSA in San Francisco a few months ago. You roam the expo halls with all the, all the you know, the vendor booths. And once you're aware of the semi-attached figure, you're going to see it everywhere. It's hard to spot unless you're specifically looking for it. So a semi-attached figure is when you have two things. You have a claim and you have proof. And the reader looks at it closely and they realize that the two things, the claim and the proof, are not related to each other. That's why it's called semi-attached, because you have claim and proof and they're not, they're not attached to each other. Um, this is kind of a hard concept to grasp without some pretty good concrete examples. Marketing and advertising professionals are absolute masters of the semi-attached figure. Here's a, a couple examples. So who remembers that the search commercial from a few years back? So at the end of every commercial, the narrator says, <clears throat> certs with Retson. It sounds good, right? It sounds great. Sounds like it'll make my stinky breath less stinky. It sounds medicinal. But that's semi-attached. So you, the audience, need proof as to why you need to buy certs. And the claim, the, the, the proof that they're giving you is with Retson. What the hell is Retson? We don't know. Another example of uh, semi-attached in a marketing claim is 25% better. 25% better than what? So do you see how this is used? So you have a statistic like 25% being offered as proof for something, but the two things, the two things are not related to each other. So here's an information security example. I love this marketing claim, unbreakable Linux. So I remember this clearly the first time I saw this. I was driving down the 101 in San Francisco and I saw this huge billboard. And I, I saw this billboard, unbreakable Linux, and I just, I just shook my head. I, I didn't know what to do or what to say or what to think about this ridiculous claim. So what this claim is referring to is a product called Oracle Linux. It's just a red, it's, it's a red Hat distro. It's, it's based on Red Hat. And this is classic semi-attached. The vendor's making a statement, like unbreakable, and it leads the reader to associate that statement with a piece of software and pretend it's the same thing. Of course, the software isn't unbreakable. It's Linux. It's been subject to a lot of the same vulnerabilities that all other Linux distros have has been subject, subject to over the years. This reminds me so much of with Redson. I mean, what does this mean exactly? What does unbreakable mean? So we go out and buy a Linux distribution that can't be what? It can't be hacked? It can't experience downtime? What if, you know, are they saying that it can be patched without being rebooted? Does this refer to high availability? We don't know. So Oracle actually still markets their distro as unbreakable, but they've backtracked quite a bit on this, and they've publicly stated that this is just a marketing tagline and doesn't refer to any specific product or feature. So <laughs> it's amazing. So here's another example of a semi-attached figure. So this is a true story. I was sitting in a vendor sales pitch a few years back, different employer, and the vendor put this graphic up on the screen. And this graphic is the number of cybersecurity incidents reported to federal agencies between 2006 and 2015. Now, this by itself is a fine graph. I have no problems with it. The, the scale looks good. The vendor was selling next generation fire technology. So people were looking at this graph and 
And the room fell silent because of the stark reality that this graph represented. And the vendor started his pitch in on us. Look at this graph. From 2006 to today, cyber attacks have increased over tenfold. We're at war here, and this is proof that we're at cyber war. And you have to protect yourself. The current equipment that you have cannot protect yourself, protect your company, against this onslaught of attacks. And the salesman went on and on and on and on. I love stuff like this. I love it when vendors build their sales pitch around a house of cards because one tap and the whole thing falls down. So does anyone see a semi-attached figure with this? So remember, semi-attached is when a claim can't be proven, so an unrelated statistic is thrown out, and then the, the, the speaker pretends it's the same thing. So the thing I ask myself when I see stuff like this is, it certainly would appear as if cyber attacks have increased tenfold from 2006 to 2015. But are there more computers now than there were in 2006? Are there more websites? Um, what's the ratio of attacks to attack surface? It, it, it doesn't tell that. And most importantly, what is the person measuring with this? What's their definition of an attack? They haven't talked about that. So this is from 2015. I have a graph from 2016. This was the 2016 report came out after our vendor pitch. So I have good news. We won the cyber war. Not really. The federal government changed their definition of what an attack is. So they no longer count simple port, span, port scans as an attack. So the, the, the people that made this data visualization changed what they were measuring. They changed the scale. They changed the unit of measurement. Tells a totally different story now. Here's another great one. So this is a related statistical bait and switch. I grabbed this from a Kaspersky, Kaspersky antivirus infographic. Did you know that one in five small businesses that pay the ransom never got their data back? Oh no, that's terrible. <laughs> that's what this graphic is saying. So this is called the framing effect. We frame statistics in emotional words or graphics in order to influence the reader. So the, worst, the, the use of the word never here is a weasel word. They're taking an objective statistic and they're interjecting subtle opinion into it. And the, think, the, the reader thinks when they see this, OMG, I'll never get my data back. What do I do? What should I do? So let's flip this around. So I took the same base statistic and I reworded it. 80% of SMBs who pay the ransomware get their data back. That actually sounds like a lot of people get their data back, right? That sounds a lot different. It's the same exact statistic as the previous infographic. Now what I'm going to do is use the same type of graphic, the same base statistic, of course, and I'm going to use a weasel word, just like Kaspersky did, and I'm going to flip it. Four out of five SMBs who pay the ransom always get their data back. Now that's completely different. That sounds great, right? Sounds like we want to be paying ransomware uh, ransom. But it should be no surprise to anyone that Kaspersky, a company that sells ransomware mitigation software, would be using the framing effect. It's very common. So the next one is called correlation does not imply causation. This is also called the post hoc fallacy. And the explanation here is simple enough. Um, you have two data points. And just because the two data points correlate with each other does not necessarily mean that one causes the other. This is a logical fallacy. And it's called spurious correlation. The term was coined by a statistician named Carl Pearson. So let's take a look at an example of a spurious correlation. 
So this is from the amazing website of Tyler Weigand. And he's analyzed hundreds of data sets and found really weird, amazing correlations. So this one is the number of people who drowned by falling into a swimming pool correlates with the number of films that Nicolas Cage has appeared in. So the website's not security related, but it's worth checking out if you are interested in logical fallacies. This is just another example of why you need to question everything. Can you see the red line on this? So it, it, if you can't see it, the red lines correlate with the yellow. They, they move up and down together. So let's take a look at another example. So this is a true story. So I was sitting in a room with a few auditors in the security department I used to work in. And the lead auditor was very, very concerned about a rash of BYOD mobile devices that were being reported lost or stolen to our security operations center. And the auditor was absolutely positive. He knew the reason why we had an uptick in this type of activity. He took the liberty of creating a chart just like this one. I've omitted the company name and have changed the date a little bit to protect the guilty. Um, so the auditor looked grimly in a room full of people. He looked grimly and pointed his finger at me. And he said, you, the security awareness training that you rolled out, you are causing this. This is the cause. You're teaching people what confidential information is, how valuable it is, and people are now stealing it. So his reasoning was is that before the security awareness training, people were blissfully ignorant about the, the um the value of the data they could access on their mobile phones. And because of the security awareness training, um, now they're stealing it. And um, this graph would seem to support that hypothesis, wouldn't it? it? It actually seems to make sense where an uptick in lost or stolen devices does correlate with the number of users that completed security awareness training. So, I don't know if this makes sense or not, does it? Or is this a spurious correlation? So post hoc fallacies like this happen when people aren't careful when they reason. And I'm seeing this a lot lately because we have a lot of data at our fingertips. And there's a tendency to get really excited when we see data. So we grab data point A and data point B and just assume that one causes the other. But it, it, it doesn't necessarily always turn out to be the case. Data should be used to construct and test a hypothesis. So with this one, um, of course, my security awareness training wasn't causing people to steal data. Um, I did an investigation. I called a lot of the people that reported their mobile devices lost or stolen and asked them about the circumstances about, you know, or surrounding the incident. And it turns out that before the security awareness training, most of the employee population had no idea that they were required to report it lost or stolen. They, they just didn't know they had to do that. The security awareness training alerted them to the fact, and then they started reporting their devices lost or stolen, and that's why there is an uptick. So the, there is a correlation here, but one doesn't cause the other. One in, is an effect of the other. I would say it's a pretty good effect, if you ask me. So to, to conclude, um, I'm going to give you a few more tips and resources. So Daryl Huff calls the manipulation of statistics statisticulation. I have a hard time saying that. So it's a combination of the two words. So hopefully you have a couple of additional tools in your toolbox to be on the lookout for these types of uh, trickeries. But I would encourage all of you to always assume good intentions. Most people out there aren't out there to deceive other people. They just simply might not know about the underlying concepts of statistics or logical fallacies or some of the best practices around data visualization. Uh, another tip is to always look at the source of the data and check it out for yourself. So if you're looking at an infographic or a report or a quote, and there isn't a source or there isn't a methodology given for the 
the, uh, for the data, you might want to be a little skeptical about it. And finally, and most importantly, don't believe everything you see or read just because it seems sciency, or because it's from a trusted vendor, or because it has a lot of data. Stephen Colbert has a word for this, truthiness. Truthiness is a truth that is so because it feels right, it feels true, without regard to evidence, facts, or logic. So here's some further reading. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, I think we have some time for questions, if anyone has any. Okay, great. Thank you very much.